and welcome to another episode of Earth 911's Sustainability in Your Ear. I'm Mitch Ratcliffe, your host. We're back with another Innovator interview. And today we're going to be talking about cartons, cartons for beverages, and increasingly a lot of other kinds of food. Tetra Pak is the largest maker of recyclable fiber cartons in the world, and it recently released its 22nd sustainability report, which includes some impressive results that we're going to talk about today with our guest. Tetra Pak has established itself globally, selling 183 billion cartons in 2020, and its brand name has become synonymous with cartons in many regions where they're referred to as a Tetra. During the last year, Tetra Pak has launched a plant-based carton made with renewable materials, shipped 12 billion caps made from plant-based materials, and they replaced the aluminum liner used in early generations of cartons with a polymer that has a 25% lower carbon footprint. Each of these innovations also contributes to making the cartons more recyclable. The company's 2030 goals are to reduce its emissions by 46% compared to its 2019 level and eliminate its scope one or internal direct emissions and scope two or all the additional indirect emissions from directly operating their company, uh, as well as to use 100% renewable energy in manufacturing and reduce water use by 50% in some of its product lines. Our guest, Lisa Ryden, is the Director of Sustainable Development at Tetra Pak. So let's dig into the 2020 Tetra Pak Sustainability Report to learn more. You can follow their progress at www.tetrapak.com. That's T-E-T-R-A-P-A-K, tetrapak.com. Welcome to the show, Lisa. How are you today? Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm doing well. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to have you here. And, and you're speaking to me from Sweden, and we're talking from two ends of a night. Uh, it's just getting dark there. It's sun's just coming up here. It's a big world, and you, Tetra Pak, have done a great job of, of spreading your business all over it. There are a lot of headline issues in the uh, sustainability report, but what would you say of all the accomplishments that Tetra Pak has made so far in terms of reducing its impact, you're most proud of? Well, I would like to put in put it into the context of the purpose of our company, mm-hmm. which is to make food safe and available everywhere, and to do that in a way that protects food, protects people, and protects the planet. So if I can frame it a little bit uh, around that purpose, so and just pick a few things, because you already did a good job of covering uh, some of it. Um, so if we look at the, the food and people parts, I mean, we are very, in, in this situation we are in right now in the world uh, with the pandemic, we are very proud to have been supporting the continuity of the safe food supplies in the world um, throughout the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, of course, we do this together with our customers and suppliers. Now, and also despite the pandemic, if we continue on this food and making, you know, distributing food to people, we have also been able to continue our collaboration in the school feeding programs uh, that have ensured that 64 million children in 45 countries have received milk or other nutritious beverages in Tetra Pak packages. Well, now you've made a lot of sustainability progress, but at the same time, we're also moving to using cartons for a wider range of, of products, as you just rec- uh, 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 mentioned. You've got a new cheese packaging process uh, that you've announced recently. And beverages, of course, are, are where cartons started. What do you see the future of, uh, uh, of cartons as food packaging? How do you see it sh- taking shape? Yeah, let me let me just, first of all, uh, just emphasize that Tetra Pak, we are leading both food processing technology as well as food packaging company. And so we deliver solutions both for processing a variety of foods and also packaging a variety of foods. And some may be more familiar with, for instance, milk and other dairy products, but we do have a wide range of categories that is already being packed today. Um, so also from all kinds of plant-based beverages to uh, tomatoes, vegetables, wine, um, and so on. And I think if we if we look ahead to the future, I mean, we have a very decades of experience in, in food technology and processing and packaging food. Um, and we also watch the trends uh, where things are going. So 
for instance, we do an annual survey called the Tetrapack Index, where we try to understand where trends go in food and beverage industry. And there we can see with the pandemic that the demand for convenient at home cooking and cooking at home uh, ingredients and products uh, is increasing. So, for instance, you could say more ready made type of um, sauces or things that can help you quickly prepare convenient meals at home. Uh, so that's one trend, an example of a trend that we see. Well, now, you've, you've, as you've done that, you've also reduced the carbon intensity of your business so that the overall footprint is not rising as your business grows. And to your point, we're using cartons and eating at home a whole lot more than we used to, amongst many other reasons that cartons are more widely accepted. How have you how did you cap emissions in 2010 and basically keep them there, reducing annual emissions by 19% across your entire carton supply chain over the last 11 years? The carbon footprint is 70% lower at Tetra Pak than it was in 2010. How did you accomplish that? Yeah, uh, we are very proud of, of this achievement of, of surpassing and overachieving on our climate goal uh, that we set in 2010 that we now could conclude in 2020. So in, in terms of our own operations, then you mentioned this reduction, 70%. Um, in, in total, you could say that our own operations is a small, quite small part of our overall value chain emissions. But on the other hand, it's the emissions that we are most in control of ourselves. And it's also where we can demonstrate <laughs> what can be done to the rest of the value chain. So therefore, we see it very important. So in terms of achieving this 70% uh, reduction, we have focused on uh, primarily three things in our own operations. So overall, it's about lowering the energy-related emissions. And mm -hmm. we do that through, uh, first of all, energy conservation. So basically to use, uh, find ways to use less energy in our operations. But also we have, put a lot of effort into improvements in energy efficiency. So for instance, we have invested 16 million euros since 2011. Um, and that has been triggered by our energy audit program um, that we do globally. Uh, and that has been a major contributor to achieving this change. And thirdly, um, a big part is the transitioning into renewable energy sources. And that uh, we have gone from 20% use of renewable electricity in 2014 to 83% last year. Um, and as you mentioned, we have the 100% goal for uh, 2030. Um, so we do, and we accomplished these, this transition to renewable energy. We do both through installing on site solar panels, but also through purchasing uh, renewable energy. Now, you, you hit on an important point. It's easier to control your own business and the emissions of your own business. And scope three is, is a much broader category in terms of all the external emissions related to your suppliers, even to the distribution of your products. How is that, a, is that actually a tractable problem? Can we really measure and understand our scope three emissions at this point? Or do you see a need for a much broader collaboration across industries to share the information about each of their contributions to the carbon emissions so that you could actually assess your, your scope three uh, impact? Well, um, I think we, uh, we have developed a data to understand uh, where we are in terms of scope three as well. I think overall in the world and, and globally, I think there is, of course, a need to continue sharing even more and maybe increasing even more uh, the standards and so on on, on data. Well, now, the other end of this is the recycling challenge. And uh, your stated recycling goals focus mostly on Europe in, in the sustainability report, where you want to achieve a 70% recycling rate by 2025 and 90% by 2030. Uh, first, why is the EU so far ahead? Uh, clearly, regulation, but also culturally, Europe is more ready to recycle. Why is that? Yeah, great question. Uh, I don't know if I have all the answers, but I think you're, you're really pointing out what I think is one of the main differences, which I think there needs to be a foundation of both the 
uh, waste management legislation, but also the waste management infrastructure, mm-hmm. which is lacking in most parts of the world. Uh, so I think that is the foundation. And then I think um, it also has a lot to do with uh, the culture <laughs> you, you mentioned. Like, And this is this something that takes time. I mean, to create habits uh, over time to make it easy for consumers to recycle and for them to know where they can recycle and then also to change the habit of actually doing it. Um, So I think, I guess those are the main reasons. Well, so you you did achieve a 27% recycling rate globally last year. How do you get to 70% in four years yeah. in Europe? Are you going to need to put incentives in place, uh, you know, a deposit program for a carton, for instance, to get people to start to bring them back more? I mean, we are considering all options here, and I think collaboration is, is what is going to be required. Of co- uh, Naturally, Tetra Pak cannot by itself uh, make this happen. And this is not for our packaging only. So overall, it's for... Also, so we work very much in a pre-competitive um, collaboration uh, to be able to achieve this. And I think that there, are, we when we work on recycling, we take very much a value chain approach. So mm-hmm. you need to make sure that all of the uh, pieces, you could say, or, or the links in the chain are working. And that means that we need to work on the design of our packaging uh, we also need to collaborate with customers and others to what we talked about, drive the consumer awareness and engagement. We want, we will engage also in the supporting of the collection and expanding the infrastructure of collection, uh, collecting and sorting cartons. Uh, we do invest in recycling capacity with recyclers and that capacity needs to grow naturally to be able to reach higher uh, rates of recycling. And finally, we also collaborate on the uh, use of the recycled materials. So meaning how can we uh, maximize the value of the materials that come from the recycling of cartons? Well, and the challenge, of course, is you can make something recyclable, but somebody has to be there to recycle it. And exactly. you mentioned the, the infrastructure. So you have 170 yeah. carton recycling facilities around the world, but there are only three in North America. And, and this is just very challenging from a U.S. perspective. Um, we need to ship stuff halfway across the country, the cartons halfway across the country in many cases, just to have them recycled. What's the plan for expanding the recycling infrastructure in North America over the next few years so that we can both start to use more cartons, which tend to be more sustainable than a lot of other packaging and um, create the kind of economic incentives that are going to create local recycling systems rather than national recycling systems that carry a much heavier greenhouse gas emissions footprint. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, uh, if we go back to the kind of the value chain or recycling Mm -hmm. value chain that I just talked about. So in the U S we are, working within the Carton Council, which is Tetra Pak together with competitors to drive the um, recycling rates of cartons. And um, if we start with the access, uh, we have uh, through our work reached a um, uh, recycling ac- household access to recycling above 60% mm-hmm. in the US now. And if we look at the recyclers themselves, we do have uh, actually, four recyclers in the U.S. now. There is one in Canada, and we have yeah. uh, quite a number of recyclers in Mexico as well. Um, so, so this is what is available at this point in time, and the work k- keeps going. You know, to of course expand from from those um, and expand the capacity and number of recyclers. So are there opportunities either for municipalities to to begin to invest in local carton recycling capabilities? Obviously, there's value to be created there. Or is this something that we need private sector investors to come in and and really recognize that they can profit from creating regional recycling systems that are much less impactful? No, these are definitely profitable uh, businesses that operate these. So Tetra Pak does not operate. Right. Uh, or own any recycling operations ourselves, but we collaborate closely with those 
um, companies that do. For instance, in Mexico, it's it's big companies like Kimberly Clark or mm-hmm. SET or Rio Papel that we work closely with to expand the capacity and capability of recycling cartons. Now you use digitization. Uh, throughout your your production process, so, so lots of digital technologies. Are you looking at ways to track the material using um, uh, uh, Internet of Things or contactless uh, uh, um, tracking technologies, so that you could actually say, you know, we know there are this many cartons out there, and there are this many that have been recycled, and there's this much value to sitting there waiting for somebody to, to collect it. Yeah, actually, I mean, in terms of the whole topic of tracking cartons and traceability. It's a topic that Tetra Pak has been exploring for many years. And uh, there are many use cases for it. So, I mean, tra- traceability can be used from, you know, everything from like fast checkout counterfeit purposes mm-hmm. um, to um, see if there's a broken cold chain and, and many other things. Um, and, in 2019, we, we did launch connected packages that are all labeled with a unique digital barcode that can be a data carrier. And um, this enables the end-to-end traceability for producers and, and greater supply chain transparency and so on. So this is something that we are working on. But if I come to the use case of recycling, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, just to be specific, um, in sorting and recycling, if you're going to track something, it's really important that the code that you're using is something that can be read at high speed, even when the carton would be kind of deformed or something. So a barcode is not the ideal uh, thing to read. And uh, one technology that's really being explored there and where we are participating in a, in a project called Holy Grail um, is the digital watermarking technology. Mm-hmm. Um, the digital watermark is an embedded code into the design print of the package. So if you would look at a carton with this code and another one, you would not see it. But if you look really but a closely... Machine could, but a machine could. Yeah, exactly. So it's actually embedded into the, the print. So it's all And it's all over the print of the package. So mm-hmm. it doesn't matter if it's deformed uh, or kind of folded um, through the collection and sorting process, it will still be able to be uh, read, the code to be read at high speed in, in a sorting facility. So that's, that's fascinating. You could actually literally say this percentage of our material is out there and has been collected. There's this much that is uncollected and represents potentially this much value. And again, going back to how do you create the incentives? whether it's for somebody to set up a local system or for a consumer to start to, to send this stuff to the right place to be recycled. There's, you've got lots of options. When do you, when will customers start to see this potentially as something that they can participate in? Uh, uh, maybe make a little bit from a, a deposit program or simply get some feedback about the outcome of their effort to recycle. Yeah, actually, uh, there has been many different types of pilots uh, looking at how to create incentives for consumers to recycle. And we have done campaigns together with customers where you tried everything from a gamification where you can collect points or where you can uh, collect points to then exchange in to other goods or, you know, products. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's something that has been piloted in, across, you know, in different countries. When it comes to deposits, uh, deposit schemes, that's also something that has been used in, in uh, certain regions. And for sure, something that it continues to be an option to be explored. Well, of all those trials, what would you say is working best? Is it is it making a game of it, making it a, a, a competition between people to see who recycles more? Or is it more important to give them a couple of cents for the effort? Well, I guess that it's not like one size fits all. It depends a little bit what country that you're yeah. in and, and the culture and, and habits uh, and all of that. But um, deposit return schemes, I mean, in general, uh, do uh, create higher recycling rates. So the last thing I want to ask you about is food waste. Obviously, you manufacture an immense amount of food or package an immense amount of food. And uh, over the last few years, you've reduced food losses during production by 50%. Uh, 
what level of efficiency for food manufacturing is actually a feasible target to achieve over the next decade? Could we reduce our food waste during the production process by as much as 100% at some point? Well, um, overall, if we look at, you know, about one third of food is lost or wasted, if you look at the whole process from start to end today. And uh, I think for Tetra Pak, I mean, the basis is the aseptic technology that we created that can help in protecting food for months without refrigeration and thereby, you know, enabling um, to minim to reduce the food waste. Um, but we have also set targets to continue to develop our solutions to be even more uh, efficient in terms of uh, less food waste. So the number 50% that you mentioned is actually um, referring to our goal, our, our midterm goal of reducing oh. production food loss by 50% in our, what we call our best practice customer lines mm -hmm. uh, by 2030. So we have this goal from 2019 to 2030 to reduce uh, 50%. So we okay. consider that a midterm goal. Okay. So thanks for correcting that. I'm sorry I misread that. Yeah. Uh, now, um, you also just raised an important point. You don't need to refrigerate many cartoned items. And that, of course, reduces the carbon footprint of the, of the food throughout the, the entire life cycle. Uh, what else could we be packaging that Tetra Pak is looking at today to reduce the need for refrigeration in the food chain? Yeah, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we are already uh, packing all kinds of uh, food and is, is there a big target out there? Is there something that you think, wow, if we could just get that industry on board, we could really make a difference? I don't think that we see any limitations in terms of what we can pack. Our scope is food and beverages. So, mm -hmm. of course, that's that's the industry that we want to uh, contribute to. Um, but um, the one thing that we... Um, that we don't pack is the carbonated uh, drinks. But besides that, uh, I think we're not have set any limitations. We do have pet food, pet food as well. Pet food, I yeah. I didn't realize, but that that actually makes sense. Now, uh, how can listeners keep up with what Tetra Pak is doing to improve its sustainability? What would you recommend they do? Well, the our, our first. The place to go is our tetrapack.com, which you highlighted in the beginning, where we uh, where we share about how we work with sustainability. We also keep our sustainability reports there. We also have our campaigns related to sustainability and uh, how we want to contribute to sustainable food transformation. So lots of information to to find there to start with. Well, information is where we start our journey. So I want to thank you, Lisa, for taking some time to talk with us today about Tetra Pak. Thank you so much. We've been talking with Lisa Ryden. She's the Director of Sustainable Development at Tetra Pak, which is the largest maker of cartons in the world. You can find out more about Tetra Pak at tetrapak.com. Tetra Pak is spelled T-E-T-R-A-P-A-K. And uh, we encourage you to think about every package that you buy and use and whether or not it can be recycled. It's, it's important uh, when you're making a buying decision uh, to understand whether or not that's going to reduce your waste output at the end of the life of the product. And so, uh, folks, take a few minutes and think about that each time you pick up anything at the store. Take a look and see whether or not there's a recycling opportunity. Recognize that not all of that packaging labeling is accurate uh, or represents what can be done in your region. And if you need information about what to do with materials that you have in your hand that you want to recycle, be sure to check out search.earth911.com. This is Earth 911's Sustainability in Your Ear. I'm Mitch Ratcliffe, and we're going to be back with another Innovator interview soon. In the meantime, folks, I hope that you will all take a few minutes to share this with this podcast and others by Earth 911 and anybody who is talking about recycling with your friends and your family, your neighbors, everybody around who might be able to make a, a contribution. And believe me, everybody can make a contribution to solving this problem. Take care of yourself. Take care of one another, and let's all take care of this beautiful planet of ours. We're going to be back soon. Have a green day.